please, the floor is yours. If you uh, don't mind sharing your presentation, we are looking forward to hear you speak. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm unfortunately looking at the sign saying you're not allowed to share you. That's all right. Just a second. It should be available now. Okay. Let me see where I am. Yep. Can you see the slides now? Yes, we can see it. Just if you could go in a full screen mode. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. So, uh, as you said already, this is uh, meant to be uh, fun, meant to be uh, a little bit outside of ordinary, and you could probably recognize the Game of Thrones uh, motifs here. The idea was not mine, belongs to an American hepatologist called Mazen Nureddin. And why I'm using it, a couple of years ago, I saw in the uh, London newspapers, it's the place where I live, uh, a strange article about the huge fat berg uh, accumulation of fat in the canals of London, which was the size of a uh, two double decker buses. So something like the one that we are seeing on the screen right now. And going back to the topic of, of Game of Thrones, uh, this is something that potentially we could consider our enemy. And uh, guys, clever folks that are trying to fight, fight with this fat accumulation, in, in, in our case, in our livers, are the heroes uh, of this uh, presentation and sunk heroes of the fat wars. So let me try to go on with the story. These are my disclosures. Anything positive that I could say about these companies or diagnostic technology you should take in a pinch of salt, but in all fairness, they, they do not uh, uh, participate in this uh, uh, next uh, 20 slides. Uh, the story of NASH, non-alcoholic steer to hepatitis, which is now also called MAFOD, to further increase the confusion, which is a metabolic associated fatty liver disease. Uh, it's not uh, very new, it's not very recent. The first description, as you see, uh, have been done in 1980. Then little by little, we, we, de we define the risk factors, which of course, uh, as you would anticipate, are diabetes type 2, metabolic syndrome, overeating, uh, very, very popular condition in, in the modern civilization. We have defined uh, histological scoring system, uh, some genetic markers, some very uh, basic and not extremely effective uh, uh, therapeutics, which are not yet registered. Nothing was registered uh, for the time being. And we also started the massive international consortiums to further study biomarkers, which will help us to develop new therapeutics in NASH. What I tried to uh, to, to mark with red, uh, Piven's trial, I will share later on. This is, uh, in, in essence, one of the main, uh, uh, one of the key points of the presentation because this is how we have established histological criteria that are uh, still being used as a registrational endpoints for NASH trials, which are a major, major part of the problem uh, related to potential successful registration of therapeutic in NASH, which I will try to explain later on. What was the new elements in 2022, a year that we are still uh, uh, not uh, uh, completely uh, you know, able to to assess because the major event, the major scientific event is in, in uh, November in United States and this is American Association meeting, but two other very telling meetings. Uh, NASHTAG happens in January, typically in Deer Valley in, in, in Utah and Paris NASH was in, in September in Paris. They were both very, very telling because uh, at this meeting, a serious uh, a revolutionary, uh, how to say this, voices were raised against the histological assessment, the histological endpoint used in NASH, both from uh, physicians, uh, both from key opinion leaders, as well as in a certain extent, especially at Paris NASH, supported by the uh, FDA uh, officials, uh, which were virtually present at the meeting. So. I'm anticipating a change in the uh, overall leading uh, overall uh, paradigm of NASH development with 
gradual replacement of histological outcome with non-invasive uh, markers of liver fibrosis and inflammation. But but I might be uh, this this optimism, of course, might be premature. How you diagnose NASH? What is the the, the pathway that physicians are, are strongly advised to use? And in this case, this is a modified mixture of the guidelines of American Gastroenterological Association and European Association for Study uh, in Liver Diseases. Uh, before I move to the uh, a very abbreviated explanation of what's actually on this heavy graph, I just want to point out that this whole uh, algorithm was created more than 10 years ago in Camden here in London when we were trying to select uh, a patient to prioritize for treatment in uh, for their hepatitis C. So the, the simple sequence of event, which is based on the basic FIP4 uh, uh, calculation and uh, el uh, elastography, fibroscan, was created more than 15 years ago. But anyways, this is now uh, in a way hijacked and reused uh, by a leading association as a diagnostic pathway for NASH. So in, ver in very simple terms, patients where you see either elevation of their liver enzymes, AST and ALT typically, or, or uh, uh, fat on abdominal sonography, uh, receiving very targeted questions related to other liver diseases and, uh, uh, you know, having a, a simple liver panel performed mostly to rule out viral hepatitis uh, and alcoholic liver disease. And pretty much everything that it's left is very, very likely, uh, except very rare conditions, of course, have, is very likely to be in an alcoholic fatty liver disease. First line of assessment is this FIP4, which is a very simple basic calculation based on the age of patients, platelets, and two transaminases. If there are alarming values of beyond 2.67, this is very likely to be a patient with significant liver fibrosis, so he will or she will have to go in the hands of my uh, brother's hepatologist, which will further assess uh, this uh, with other non-invasive technologies listed in front of you, a more complex and more expensive ELF test. Uh, the sophisticated name of vibration control transient elastography, also known as fibroscan or magnetic resonance elastography, uh, 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 showing uh, threshold values of liver fibrosis of beyond F3. And then they unfortunately could not do much other than suggesting the basic weight loss and exercise uh, uh, activities and potentially consider some off-label basic treatments, which I will share on the on the next slide. Patients with less than 1.3 FIP4 uh, don't have to do much other than again potentially uh, adopting a more healthy lifestyle. Patient in the middle, the so-called gray zone of this uh, schematics, will need to undergo additional tests in order to whether in order to join either left panel or right panel based on this other confirmatory test which surprise surprise are the same elf and elastography technology so in essence not a hugely complicated diagnostic pathway with very limited treatment option and pretty much diagnostic modalities which are the same at least in the center and to your left when a diagnosis uh, is uh, being made uh, by, you know, hepatologists or even some uh, relatively modern GP, what would be the discussion with the patient? What this patient should be warned about? What is his prognosis in terms of a, a liver-related complication? And I, I did mention that some of the threshold values on the previous screen are indicative of uh, advanced fibrosis or what we call histologically bridging fibrosis. This is uh, the, the central panel of this graph. Uh, this is coming from American uh, NASH CRN network, which is showing the potential likelihood of events of liver decompensation in the last four years based on a sizable uh, population of almost 2,000 patients followed by them. So not a great amount of, the, uh, of events are likely to occur in the next uh, four years. But still, uh, this is not a negligible risk uh, when you are in the stage of bridging fibrosis. Cirrhotic patients, which are uh, uh, less so prevalent in this cohort, of course, have a much more increased chances of liver-related complication and death, and therefore 
they're definitely a, a major concern in terms of potentially providing them with the solutions. I mean, solutions before the ultimate chance to, to get a liver transplantation, which might not be possible in each and every country in the world. The study, the academic collaboration that was uh, largely uh, uh, the, the foundation of the histological uh, endpoints and pathways uh, shown before uh, was this Pivens trial done by the same American uh, Nash uh, CRN uh, here, a publication by Arun Yao in 2010, New England Journal of Medicine, largely showed us two things, uh, one good, one not so good. The first one was, of course, that certain improvement in uh, the Nash histology, uh, given the main elements of this histological uh, picture of Nash, is possible with a very basic uh, medication like pioglitazone and vitamin E, which are both shown to do certain extent to improve histological uh, picture of NASH, even if uh, even if pioglitazone was not really able to move uh, fibrosis, which is meant to be the main feature and the most alarming feature, going back to the prior slide uh, and the one uh, definitely related to uh, uh, events of decompensation and liver-related death. So you could effectively uh, improve NASH even if this study uh, primary endpoint was negative. The second one, which, which I will call not very positive, was the solid establishment of this histological assessment as a potentially, uh, to this day, only potential approvable uh, uh, endpoints, approvable surrogate endpoints, which were then very gladly adopted by FDA and still is the only way by which you could approve a NASH therapeutic. Problem being that some of these features, like for example, the famous hepatocellular ballooning, this presence of a very much deformed and distorted by fat accumulation liver cells, it's a, a feature on the histological side that very few pathologists, even when they're highly specialized in NASH, can actually agree upon. And this is leading to a major, major issues. Uh, some uh, anecdotal evidence I will show later on how bad their inter-observer agreement is. So when we proposed this, this uh, to be used for future NASH trial, and when we uh, suggested this to FDA as a society, we effectively uh, shot ourselves in the foot because we had no idea whether this would be able to detect changes driven by therapeutics. We had no idea what the agreement between hepatologists will be. And even if further consortiums were, uh, were embarking to, to study this better, like uh, the Litmus Consortium uh, in Europe, uh, before that uh, uh, the FLIP Consortium, which was largely focusing on agreement between pathologists, we are still in, in uh, very early in this pathway, and this is really seriously hampering our ability to develop anything. Simply, the, the way we measure efficacy is, is, very, is very basic, is very blunt, does not really work. And at the meetings that I referred to, Nash Tech and Paris Nash, there were voices saying, this is a dead end. We are going nowhere. We are killing therapeutics every month simply because we don't know how to measure efficacy in NASH trials, and, and this is really, really concerning. What are the current endpoints in, in the early phase clinical trial? Let's say here in front of you are the endpoints typically used in, uh, in phase 2A trials, which are normally 200 strong type of trials with NASH therapeutics, whereby the, the, the biotech companies or, or pharmaceutical companies responsible will have to make a go-no-go -go decision whether this is to go into five-year, 2,000 patients, 100 million, beyond 100 million type uh, three, uh, phase three registration on trial. So the encouraging signs of efficacy as they currently stay are 5% improvement in the absolute value of the uh, this MRI technology called MRI PDFF, proton density fat fraction or uh, a slightly different way to use the same data, the same reading is uh, beyond 30% relative reduction of this very same uh, liver fat quantification, which is very, very precise, which is very good, which is very well established, multiple technologies exist, and of course works on you know, all of the three major scanners. 
problem being not all the agents are what we call using our uh, jargon not all the agents are defatting and once they are defatting uh, you will see some strong results later on not necessarily change fibrosis which would be the ultimate histological endpoint in the next phase of clinical trial so this signal is encouraging but might not be decisive and had already tripped many many different companies and uh, a very basic uh, also signal of efficacy are the transaminases whereby a good improvement is considered to be of beyond 70 percent uh, change from baseline and this is a very obviously a very simple and unprecise tool which we were always using in liver disease and uh, to in certain extent uh, could not really uh, convincingly predict uh, success in NASH. Moving to phase three, the real decisive uh, uh, trials in, in, in NASH, we have only these two histological surrogate endpoints, which are focusing on either NASH resolution, which in essence is resolution improvement of the underlying state of hepatitis. So in very simple terms means improvement of liver inflammation or fibrosis improvement, which is uh, fibrosis improvement of at least one stage. And we uh, ideally would like this not to be associated with worsening of steatohepatitis hepatitis and, and vice versa. And you will see how this is being uh, achieved or not by uh, the few companies that managed to, 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 to present and defend such, a, such an improvement. Histological agreement, uh, agreement between uh, the uh, histological readers, between highly specialized, famous liver pathologists, uh, was uh, studied in this uh, recent publication, and you could see uh, in the cap of values below how uh, bad the agreement between different readers is. And while there was a considerable effort to align, to train, to agree uh, uh, in advance, we are still in, in, in the infancy of this uh, histological reading, uh, let's say compared to the clinical trials in IBD. Very recently, a very basic uh, structure of this reading was for the first time established that you need to have at least two readers, and if they disagree, a third one to adjudicate their differences. So this very basic principle was uh, uh, established in a NASH clinical trial very, very recently, and, and after we had uh, some catastrophes, uh, uh, namely, namely uh, the results of the Sima Bay uh, NASH clinical trial, which I probably wouldn't have time to explain because it's a presentation on its own. Other issues in uh, clinical trial in NASH other than limitations of pathology, which in a certain way we imposed on ourselves, not, not very cleverly. So the Hawthorne effect is uh, the, the, the ability of human beings to, to behave better under observation, behave better in the case of NASH is probably eating better and moving a little bit better and not abusing alcohol because NASH patients, contrary to the name itself, are, are still using some uh, amounts of, of alcohol. So in essence, they do improve their liver health and probably their general health when they're uh, in, uh, enrolled in clinical trial. And this is leading to a very interesting phenomenon of uh, amazingly high placebo response rate in NASH, up to 30% in some clinical trials, which is mostly probably done, mostly probably uh, due to their improved uh, behavior, their better uh, uh, physical activity, and in essence, they're doing something that it's improving their liver health regardless of whether they are uh, they are on on the active arm of the study, CSO effect is is something very also interesting, probably related to the previous uh, phenomenon. We saw this in Scenic Rivy Rock Phase Two studies. Effectively, there were patients in the two year study which were spontaneously improving and worsening during these two years because there was a baseline biopsy, year one biopsy, and year two biopsy. You see patients that are improving on the active arm, but also they are worsening in the next year, regardless of the uh, of the fact that they're receiving the same potentially effective treatment, and 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 vice versa. Patients on on placebo arm also spontaneously improving and worsening, regardless of the fact that they are not receiving anything 
other than potentially the placebo effect that we will briefly touch on. Confusing, there are ways to deal with it, but probably uh, not so, not so uh, how to say, convincing at this point in time. Multiple agents are uh, uh, being studied. I will show you again uh, this uh, table later on in a slightly different style. And some of the recent results of the, let's say, uh, front runners uh, in this space definitely FXR agonist as well as the uh, THR beta thyroid hormone replacement uh, treatments, which are likely to to be close to the to the finish line. Before that, there are very effective treatments that exist for NASH and very simple ones. Caloric intake uh, limitation, weight loss, especially weight loss uh, in the desired limits of 10% from baseline. It's very, very effective in improving all the features of NASH, even fibrosis. And of course, this typically would require some exercise and limitation in the alcohol consumption. Drinking coffee, apparently, is very good. So if you could replace your red wine with uh, two cups of coffee, that seems to be able to, to do the trick. Unfortunately, it's very, very difficult to impose this healthy lifestyle on humans. Uh, and most of the ones that are uh, achieving some degree of improvement uh, in the longitudinal studies are not able to maintain this in the subsequent years. So, in essence, I think as a society, we gave up on our ability to impose healthy lifestyle on this particular type of patients. And, and that's probably uh, valid across the board, thinking of cardiovascular and, and diabetes type 2 uh, situations when similar measures will be recommended and very, very, very rarely uh, uh, followed by patients. Uh, even more effective, uh, the most extreme, the most effective uh, uh, way for us to reduce body weight in morbidly obese patients, of course, is bariatric surgery. And you could see here in, 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 in blue, the ability of this uh, surgical treatment to achieve a no NASH status to deal with the baseline uh, NASH after one year and after five years is, is really impressive with fibrosis improvement achieved in, in more than 70% of the patients, which is followed by uh, multiple other biomarkers improvement. Unfortunately, this is expensive and not uh, uh, very light surgery. Uh, and while in certain countries like UK, patients with body mass uh, uh, BMI beyond 35 and diabetes type 2 could qualify for the, the, the intervention. Uh, definitely, the current situation of the healthcare and the, the, the wait list for this uh, are such that we could not really turn the tide of NASH uh, uh, using bariatric surgery. Probably no country could do that, even if we decide that that's the way to go forward. Uh, you do remember probably some of the heroes from uh, this uh, movie. Uh, the ones that I'm showing here are slightly different heroes, the unsung uh, heroes uh, of Fat Wars. Uh, you see here a couple of houses on top based on the mode of action of their products uh, they are developing. You see here always powerful and never to be underestimated house of the Nash key opinion leaders with some famous faces from United States and Europe, uh, uh, which I don't have the time to present to you in person, even if I would like to, to do that. The famous house of liver pathologists, the guys that are uh, currently reading the slides and deciding yes or no for multiple agent, which effectively are, are hampering our ability to develop therapeutics, because not only this is not a perfect technology to assess uh, a treatment effect, but they are very few and far between. And as you could see on the sites, no, none of them is without due respect in, in teenage. There are not that many that are coming able to replace the big uh, stars of liver pathology. So this whole kind of pathway of approving and deciding whether NASH is improving is definitely destined to fail, simply because we will never have enough great pathologists to read these thousands of slides. So this is, as I said, probably a suicidal move from our society if we are to move this, this forward. House of Basic Science, these are mostly guys with uh, big names in the liver fibrosis uh, uh, studies, uh, hugely important as well, because they will be also the ones deciding on the 
beneficial effects of certain uh, liver diagnostic tools. Uh, and they are doing this very, very well. House of FDA and uh, AMEA, uh, even if the two faces here, I'm saying the old commissioner of FDA gastro division and the new uh, interim head of the liver division of FDA are the guys that are supposedly working on, as they are recently uh, recognized on NASH uh, meeting in Paris, working on a pragmatic non-invasive pathway to develop therapeutic in NAS, which is a hugely a uh, hugely beneficial development and something FDA never ever recognized before. So hopefully this is the case. Uh, going uh, through the top of the graph, the pharmaceutical uh, pharmaceutical guys, pharmaceutical heroes, you see in the house of FXR, this is David Shapiro, the former CMO of uh, Fintercept, the front runner uh, and a potential uh, likely first therapeutic to be approved in NASH, which I'll spend some time describing. Uh, on the PPAR side, this is Sujo from Sima Bay, guy whereby teaches mostly some of the limitations of the current uh, uh, assessment of liver histology. On the other side, House of FGFs, this is team from Akiro, uh, a hero of the recent press releases and definitely one of the encouraging uh, compounds that are coming uh, through the pipeline. But unfortunately, I don't have more time to present all of these heroes to you. But of course, you could do that uh, in your free time if you if you wish so. More compounds, huge amount, not really possible to cover any of those in a great amount of details. Failures seen to, to the left of the graph, some big companies with powerful portfolios yesterday uh, are now just joining the list of uh, failures. Gilead, uh, notably, uh, one of the liver companies uh, that uh, entered Nash uh, Chase with arrogance and power and lots of money, haven't been able to achieve much. Uh, Novartis uh, as well, uh, many others. Pfizer recently quietly announced the termination of not one, but three different assets attacking three different modes of action, all potentially beneficial for NASH. So uh, watch this space. What we currently have, uh, referring here to what was uh, available and getting into the decisive phase three uh, before the pandemic. Uh, we don't have time to cover everything, but definitely a few moments for rubetic oleic acid that belongs to Intercept, Resmeterome of uh, Madrigal, uh, semaglutide, which was considered by many to be one of the uh, one of the dark horses of Nash Chase, being developed by the famous uh, Novo Nordics company with solid positions in diabetes type two and obesity, which seems to be the two pathognomonic features of Nash anyway. So, if anybody knows about these patients, that should be Novo, right? Uh, probably not. Going back to the uh, interim results of the uh, first uh, uh, potentially uh, trial to reach the end, uh, the, the, the desired endpoint, this is Regenerate from Intercept. This is actually the first interim result. They later on issued a second press release with second uh, assessment of the same data, all pretty much telling us one and the same. If you look at the improvements of fibrosis, which uh, was always meant to be the strong feature of FXR agonist and particularly obetic oleic acid, there is statistical significant improvement of fibrosis in the high dose of obetic oleic uh, uh, acid as compared to placebo. They have missed statistical significance in the uh, their ability to 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 prove Nash resolution. But nevertheless, their primary endpoints is, is worded in such way that they effectively have a successful readout and based on the FDA own rules should have been given a provisional license as early as 2019 when these data were published in Lancet. Unfortunately for Intercept and probably for the whole field, FDA put on hold the submission ask for a readout, a new readout of all the histological slides, which was done uh, by the company uh, recently, the results were confirmed. So now we are watching FDA very, very carefully because they either will have to give them a provisional license 
or share their original concerns, whatever this, that original concerns were in 2019, because that was never publicly disclosed. Rumors are going around that cardiovascular safety of the compound, that it's known to increase low density lipoproteins might not be perfect, but that, that at least is not seen by the uh, available and published safety data for the trial. So interesting days uh, for FDA related to, to this compound in particular. Dr. Tanev, would you mind wrapping up because we are two minutes over time and we also have a few questions. Wow, wow, wow. Yeah, uh, probably, <laughs> probably I won't be able to cover then most of the other compounds that I was thinking to cover. But let's go directly to what is potentially a bit of a, a, a summary slide related to one of the two histological end, uh, endpoints, NASH resolution. So you see here again uh, some results uh, uh, in terms of absolute effect as well as the improvement over placebo, whereby we are uh, getting some, some successes probably comparable to the weight loss of 5% uh, of our body weight. So not really a dramatic effect uh, in semaglutide case, uh, Novo Nordic compound as well as in Ventila Lanifibranor. So that's encouraging. When we're talking about fibrosis improvement, similar slide not to be uh, taken on its face value because these are different different studies. You see some encouraging also improvement again in in one uh, uh study and a uh, few others. So uh, watch the space. Uh, that might be something to finally uh, lead to an approval of Nash therapeutics. And this is my uh, last slide, uh, uh, which is probably good enough to open the, the discussion. Uh, sorry for for being for running out of time, but obviously this is a huge topic, so I'm 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 ready to address any questions. Thank you, Dr. Tonek. Indeed, it is a huge topic, and to be honest, I believe this is the first time we are actually talking about Nash on Biotech Atelier. And it's really important that you've shed um, such a light on the topic and the problem. Uh, we have time only for one question, but I just want to tell the public that the presentation will probably be available afterwards and your questions will be forwarded to uh, Dr. Toner for later re reply. So the question is about NASH prevention. Um, is there a way to actually prevent NASH? And if yes, what is it? It's a, it's a very it's a very good question and, and a very simple even if not entirely uh, how to say uh, convincing answer healthy lifestyle and maintaining a proper body weight seems to be a, a very effective way to prevent NASH. We are talking about uh, about uh, NASH in, in in skinny patients, particularly in Asia, which is probably mostly genetically determined by the way known genetic uh, markers of NASH whereby this uh, healthy lifestyle probably would not be sufficient. But for the vast majority of patients, just eating better and, and having a, a decent amount of physical activity probably will be sufficient prophylaxis. Indeed, thank you so much uh, for thank contributing to Biotech Atelier. It was a pleasure to hear you speak. Mm -hmm.